You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television for you, by you. The Gabriola Arts Council respectfully acknowledges that the land on which we live, work, and create so creatively is the unceded territory of the Sinema First Nation, whose existence has been here, presence has been for since time immemorial. I have to acknowledge the Government of Canada, and in particular the Department of Canadian Heritage, uh, for their support of our Breaking Bannock program. And the Breaking Bannock program is actually funding this, this event tonight, One Book, One Community. Uh, funding for all IOTA is also provided by BC Arts Council, the Community Gaming Grant, the RDN, and through also all our, our brochure advertisers. Thank you to all our thumb funders. Now, I'll turn it over to Ardeth Cooper, who will introduce our main event tonight, what you all came to see and hear tonight. Ardeth. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kamchatsia. Kamchatsia, my grandmother's name. As many of you know, my dad, my father, Walsia, was from Tsaok, Souk, and my grandpa, Quisto, was from Pachidot, the West Coast. My mother was Snenemo, Andrea Wesley. These are my family. I'm tempted to introduce myself with my other name, Ardeth, by saying, Je m'appelle Ardeth Cooper, after the opening the other night <laughs> with the remarkable Joël Rebou. Wonderful start off to the um, Isle of the Arts. I want to thank you, friends, um, the Indigenous Book Club in particular, for helping along to, and always supporting the work that we put forward here. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming out on a busy, long weekend. It's a pleasure to see so many familiar faces and to know of your support. Um, and again, that the beauty about this island is that if you need some errand done, somebody like Toby Elliott will run off to the co-op and do whatever needs to be done. <laughs> um, it's such a pleasure to have so many supportive and welcoming friends here. It's my honor to introduce our own Catherine Palmer Gordon. Many of you know her as our friend and neighbor and that she is an accomplished author of six books and as well as a busy lawyer. Catherine is a recent friend to me. My late sister Sandy sang Catherine's praises through her work with Snenemo. And as many of you know, she has been instrumental in the launch of our recent Breaking Bannock project of which this event is a part. Of course, we are fortunate to have her generous support, and I feel important to recognize that between her work here in BC, working with First Nations, and her work in New Zealand, where her wonderful dad resides, we have in our midst one of the top experts in the world in matters of treaty making and reconciliation in BC and New Zealand. <laughs> It's my pleasure to introduce Catherine, who will conduct this evening's presentation with the equally amazing Angela Starrett and Manawan, who's also here visiting us. Thank you, enjoy the evening. It's just beautiful to see this room filled with so many familiar faces. And frankly, as I was saying to Angela a little earlier this evening, so many faces that I, I haven't seen before. And I think that really reflects on the journey that Gabriel is going on in terms of reconciliation and wanting to learn and to, to understand. Angela is an award-winning investigative journalist and national best-selling author from the Walt Bugak of the Gitmax community within the Gitsan Nation on her father's side and from Belle Island, Newfoundland on her maternal side. Angela worked as a television 
radio and digital journalist at CBC for more than a decade, during which she hosted the award-winning CBC original podcast, Land Back. Among her many accolades and awards, in 2017, she accepted the Investigative Award of the Year from Canadian Journalists for Free Expression for coverage of missing and murdered Indigenous women. She was awarded a prestigious William Southern Journalism Fellowship at Massey College in Toronto and was the first known First Nations person in Canada ever to receive that award in the school's 60-year history. In 2021, Angela won a Canadian Screen Award for Best Reporter of the Year in Canada for her coverage of an Indigenous man and his then 12-year-old granddaughter who were arrested while trying to simply open a bank account at the Bank of Montreal. She also won a National Radio Television Digital News Association Award for the same reporting. And in 2020, Angela was named in Vancouver Magazine's Power 50 list of the city's 50 most influential people. Her book, Unbroken, My Fight for Survival, Hope and Justice for Indigenous Women and Girls, is a work that is part memoir and part investigation into the murders and disappearances of Indigenous women and girls. Published by Greystone Books, Unbroken became an instant national bestseller in May last year. Unbroken has also been nominated for the Governor General's Literary Awards, which is one of Canada's oldest and most prestigious literary prizes, was a finalist in the 2023 Hillary Weston Writers Trust Award for Best Non-Fiction Book in Canada. Angela, it's such an honour and welcome to be with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you for reading that long, embarrassing uh, <laughs> role of my, myself. <laughs> Thank you. All extremely well deserved. Angela, at the beginning of Unbroken, you write a note to readers, and I know I have your full permission to read that note out to everybody this evening. I think it's a very good way for all of us uh, to start. This book took an ocean of courage. As I cut through parts of the past, I'd rather put behind me I was often sinking in my own trauma or learning how to hold it in kindness and love. But the strength that took the family members of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls to trust me, to share their stories, and to travel intimately with their pain of losing a loved one, in many cases horrifically, was unmatched. It unearthed unimaginable suffering. While in some ways this is a dark and harrowing read, in others, it is beautiful and loving, filled with all the care and compassion Indigenous people live in and give. This book, amassed from years of difficult conversations, recognises and explores the full, complex picture of violence against Indigenous women and girls. In reading this work, you will visit the depths of long-lasting and intergenerational trauma that is the direct result of colonial violence and genocide. In my search for justice and healing, this book touches on difficult themes like suicide, assault, violence and childhood abuse. Mostly though, I am searching to honour the hope and love that permeates the spirits of all of our people. In my news stories, I provide trigger warnings on articles that could cause victims or readers trauma. For this book, in addition to this warning, I'm hoping to send an offering of love, kindness and care to blanket and comfort you as you take this journey with me. That's true for that note, Angela. You know, the, this book is remarkable in terms of the courage and strength that you, you mentioned. It truly is a work uh, that comprises a relentless litany of the systemic injustice and horror that has been experienced by so many Indigenous women and girls and their families, of course. But you also speak to the fact that to understand these stories fully, readers need to understand what it looked like pre-colonisation, what the leadership roles of women were, their strength, their brilliance. And I'm just going to read a couple of things you say about that in the book. You say that to understand their stories, of those who have survived and for those who cannot share, 
You have to begin at a time that has been erased or warped by the colonials, a time when Indigenous women were revered as the backbone of our communities. And you also add, Europeans entering Indigenous territories for the first time were shocked seeing the high-ranking and leadership positions Indigenous women held in their communities. It was not long before Europeans realised that to dominate the land and people that were occupying it, they needed to disempower the women, writes Kim Anderson, in a recognition of being reconstructing native womanhood. Removing us from the land was a critical part of the colonial empire building project. Could you tell us a little bit more about why that theme, the role of women pre-colonisation and the deliberate attempt to erase those roles, why is that such an important theme in this book? Well, I think one of the messages that I want to bring forward is present day roles of Indigenous women. Um, that colonization had little effect on us as strength, in terms of strength, in terms of leadership roles, in terms of the way that we're revered by our own communities. We continue to be the backbone. We continue to be the ones that carry the knowledge, that carry the stories, that carry the strength, that carry the children. Um, that starkly um, contrasts the ways that we are seen by the colonials, right? Um, and in, in the sense that we matter very little. So those positions and those roles in our community are still very much so alive. And that's the, the, the reality check that colonization failed, right? And I think people have a hard time in this society um, realizing that for one, we're, we're still here. We are not erased, we are not gone. Um, you know, we have the strength of people like Ardith here to remind us that of that. Um, I'm still here, you know, my, my people are still here. And, and to take note of the fact that colonization isn't a thing of the past. It's very much still alive. The government didn't just stop and say, oh, we're going to stop taking the land, right? The province of British Columbia, the government of Canada, continues to fight Indigenous people in court today. Mm -hmm. There are more than 250 court cases that Indigenous people have won fighting the federal and provincial governments. Um, and still, to this day, the governments are continuing to take the land, right? So when we talk about land back, it's not like, oh, we're fighting for something that was taken. It is that we are still fighting this system today. And so that's... Um, that's really a gift of, um, of indigeneity in you know, the territories that we have today is that we have the gift of modernity. And you know, we look at many countries around the world, um, you know, it's the colonization has had happened for thousands of years. You know, in, in some of my villages, um, colonization only took hold in the 90s, right? And so people, the gift of modernity being that people realize this is wrong. This is wrong to treat um, indigenous people this way, you know, with the abuse and the torture. But, but, but the reality is we're still living in a process of colonization today. It, it didn't end. The horrors of residential school and some of the most um, difficult parts of colonization um, were interrupted and were resisted but they continue to this day. Land theft continues, dispossession continues. Um, I am still an Indian under the Indian Act. Race-based legislation still continues. And in the face of that, Indigenous women still continue to be leaders, the strength, the voice, um, refusal to remain silent. Um, we still revere Indigenous women in our communities and Indigenous people um, as, as life givers and as providers and as the strength. The way that the colonials view Indigenous people is what's not the same, is what's foreign, is what's alien to my people. Mm. And of course, one of the worst examples of how women have been treated, it's the core 
of Unbroken and what we've been writing about. And, and you know, the stark fact and it is now officially admitted by the government of Canada, it took a long time coming, uh, it, it's nothing short of genocide, right? Whether that's individual or systemic, uh, call it for what it is, especially over the last few decades. And that hasn't ended, as you, you just um, you just reminded us. In this book, you start with an immemorial section in which you name every single um, of the missing women and, and uh, girls in, who've been murdered along the Highway of Tears or in Vancouver or missing. And it's a really distressing thing to read. It's very heartbreaking to read every single name and take the time to give them attention. Why did you choose? Why was it so important to start the book that way? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing to note that somebody uh, in a media interview with me recently pointed out is that she realized in turning these pages, you know, there's hundreds of names listed. And she said, oh, I can't find my, my relative here. And then she realized, oh, this is only women who've been missing or um, murdered along the highway tiers and from the Picton farm. If this, if this were a list exemplary of all the women who were Indigenous women who were missing or murdered in Canada, that would take the whole book, right? And so it was important for me with that list to provide the women a name, a nation, a face, a life, um, not just who they are in their deaths, right? And in a lot of um, cases, it took a lot of research. A lot of media had women's names wrong. They had not listed her nation. They had not listed her community, her age. Um, a lot of it took, you know, firsthand research, talking to family members, and that's a traumatic experience for families to unearth this pain, unearth these memories, and so it, it, took, it took a lot to get to that information. The other thing that this list provides is how and who killed the women, right? And that's, there's, there's misconceptions about who kills Indigenous women and girls, right? There's this myth that was put out by a police chief, I believe around 2010, who said, it's actually Indigenous men killing Indigenous women. You know, Indigenous people are killing their own. And so a chief from, from Ontario said, where did you get that information? And he said, we're not really willing to release that right now, but it will come. We promise you that information will come. And when you look at the RCMP's report into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, they list how and who the woman has been murdered, who by the woman has been murdered. And so... Um, in large part, it's acquaintances, right? And so an acquaintance can be somebody who's bagged your groceries at the store. It can be somebody you pass by on the street every day. It could be a John, right? And so, so they took acquaintance to mean somebody within your own community. So there's a lot of misconceptions, right? And somebody asked me, I was in Portland, and they said, who's killing Indigenous women and girls? And I said, um, well, when you look at the demographic of serial killers, for example, it's the same as who's killing Indigenous women. It's for the large part white men, right? The bulk of the serial killers are white males who are killing Indigenous women. And so that was something that I wanted to deeply investigate in my book as well, because there's those myths out there about who is committing violence against Indigenous women and girls and why there's such impunity and why that continues. And so it lists, um, when it comes to the highway tears, um, the, the race of the man who killed the woman, if she was killed by a serial killer, and where she was murdered from. And that was really important for me to find that data. There's a lot of missing data when it comes to Indigenous women and girls, but also Indigenous people. That comes through very much in your, in your writing, in which you explain that there seemed to be a lot of effort, uh, whether it was on the part of the police or the media, almost to protect the killers mm -hmm. rather than the women. And as part of that, really stereotype these women as being um, mm -hmm. inconsequential is the kindest word I can think of. Mm -hmm. and, and you take huge efforts to ensure that we don't do the same as readers of the book. You emphasise very, very strongly 
that these women were you know, beloved friends, they were beloved members of their family, of their communities. They were real, beautiful human beings. They laughed, they loved, they cried, they suffered, they had dreams of the future, just like all of us do, uh, cut short by these men that you just described. They were all important people in their own right, important individuals. So naming that was naming them was part of the, the journey. Um, but I think it would be it would be um, beautiful for you to maybe tell us a bit more about one or two of these women to bring life to them for us this evening as well. Mm. I mean, one of the women that sticks out a lot to me is Ramona Wilson. She was uh, 16 when she went missing in 1994. Um, she was uh, the responsible one in her friend group. She had a job at a restaurant. She was that summer going to become a summer counselor. Um, she was the, the youngest one in her family. So she was, you know, very close with her nephews and her nieces. She loved pineapple and uh, ham, is it, pizza? She loved curling up with her mom, watching TV, eating lasagna. And she was from the same community as me. She was from Get the Max, and she was also living away from home. She was living in Smithers. And she was also like me. She was a writer. She was a poet. And she was also like me in that she had a belief in a higher power. She believed in God. You know, I believe in my ancestors. And so I really related to her story. And, you know, in the North, there is a massive um, lack of uh, affordable transportation system. There was no cell service until 2023. Um, affordable transportation system didn't come into the area until 2018. And there's also the reality of forced dislocation. Indigenous people forced from their traditional territories onto tiny tracts of land, you know, in, in many ways, in many cases, far flung um, and impoverished. You know, we were not allowed to hunt. We were not allowed to fish. We would go to jail. We would be fined. And we were also not able to participate in settler society. We would also be fined. There was a pass system. You know, there was a visa system. You needed a pass to leave the reserve. You know, I don't think people realize that this system still exists and it's apartheid in Canada that was modeled by South Africa. And so when she wanted to go to something that all teenagers should have the privilege of doing, a graduation ceremony, she was forced to do so by the only way that was possible at, her, at the time, which was hitchhiking. Um, and she was never seen again. And the police at the time were like, oh, you know, she's probably just out having fun. And this was very unusual for her friends and for her family. As I said, she was the responsible one in her friend group and the police cast them away as, you know, this is a single parent home, they're irresponsible, you don't know your daughter. And everyone was raising the alarm at the same time. Um, take note, wanted to, for them to raise the alarm, wanted them to hold fundraisers. Melanie Carpenter's killer was found the next day. Ramona Wilson's killer is still out there at large. We still have no idea what happened to her, how she was murdered, but we know she was murdered and her remains were found a year later. Before Ramona was went missing, three other indigenous teenagers were also missing, you know, within the month. So this was already, you know, it should have raised the alarm bells for the authorities, for the media, for the public but it didn't, and it didn't really raise the alarm until a white woman went missing along the highway tiers, Nicole Horror. And there was a multi-million dollar search effort to find her and to find her killer. And um, as I talk about in my book, you know, it's um, widely known that her killer is most likely in prison now. So um, Ramona Wilson is one that I carry really deep and dear in my heart. She reminded me a lot of me. I spoke in an event and her sister was there. I was speaking to Prince George and I kept on saying, you know, you know, I could have been her. I could have met her fate. And her sister stood up and said, you know, you keep on saying you could have been her, but I keep hearing you talk and I keep hearing, you know, she could have been you. She could have been a writer. She could have been a journalist. She could have been speaking on a stage about the truth like you, but her life was cut far too short. Mm -hmm. And that just um, is a repeated cycle where young women like Ramona and others were 
categorized by the police and by the system as being um, vulnerable, if you like, or leading lifestyles that were more prone to then becoming victims of harm. So hitchhiking or mm -hmm. living in Vancouver on the streets. And that was an experience that you yourself shared, um, that as part of your growing up, you were, it could have been you. Mm -hmm. Are you comfortable sharing a little bit about your own story and your own journey and how it relates into these stories? Yeah, I mean, I can relate to a lot of the young women in my book who, um, you know, grew up on the streets. I mean, that wasn't Ramona's story. I mean, a lot of the women and girls in my book are not like me. Um, they came from really good homes. You know, thinking about Levina Moody, she had a, you know, she came from a very high-ranking cultural family. Um, she came from a big family. She came from a, a revered family. Um, and they, you know, went shopping in Williams Lake. It's like Gabriel Island leaving to go to the big island, I guess, and I'm all right to go shopping. And she did so in Williams Lake and was murdered by three men. So a lot of the women were not um, living in unsafe situations. Um, and in many cases, you know, the, the unsafety of them was merely by being Indigenous, by being an Indigenous woman. Mm. When you were a lot younger and um, struggling with some of these issues yourself, it ended up being, you ended up being in a situation where you were living in Vancouver um, you did have some accommodation, but it wasn't a great place to be. But you met some of these women probably at that age as well, the women who were like the women in the book. Can you tell us a little bit more about your own experiences? Yeah, I mean, for me, I think it's really important to highlight the, the positive, right? I think it's important to, pause it, to highlight the the fact that there are many indigenous women and girls who are still here who have survived many things and in my book i talk a lot about like you said at the beginning about it's not just about trauma right and i think the media and non-indigenous people are really drawn to what i consider trauma porn and that's not something that a lot of indigenous people want to share anymore we are more than just our trauma we are more than just despair. We are more than just hopelessness. We are powerful. We are strong. I'm an award-winning investigative journalist. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of the people who ask me these types of questions come from hard times as well, right? But um, I think oftentimes people want to position Indigenous people as just in their trauma. And we're three-dimensional human beings who are more than just that um, and who have a lot more to share than just that. In working with the women uh, and the families who shared their stories with you in, in the book, as an author myself who has written with other people, I'm acutely aware of how important that relationship is with, with the people that you write with and, and how important it is to have trust and uh, authenticity. And you talk about you, you know, your motivation to write the book is... It's reflected right in the cover, and for anybody who doesn't know, the cover of the book is from one of Angela's own paintings. Um, it's entitled, Honour the Dead, Fight for the Living, Honour the Living, Fight for the Dead. And, and, and the title itself also reflects your motivation to fight for survival, for justice, for hope. And, and how you talk about how you became a trusted voice, in part through your own experience, in part through that very strong vision of hope and better. Uh, future and the strength and the stories of giving them the stories of their families. But at the same time, you're also sometimes seen as part of the system, as, as a journalist, as part of that systemic media system that is quite racist and continues to be. How did you find your way into those relationships with the women, with the families who were so willing to share their stories with you? I mean, I don't think that was the hard part of being a journalist for me. <laughs> um, relationships with Indigenous people came very easy to me, right? I'm an Indigenous journalist and very rare in the industry. Um, I think the, the industry kind of like chews us up and spits us out in many regards, right? We're, uh, we're difficult to assimilate 
into colonial um, industries, colonial institutions. I think the hard part of being a journalist in mainstream media was um, not assimilating, choosing not to assimilate to that institution of media. Um, I mean, I've been a storyteller my whole life, right? My, I come from a long line of storytellers. That part of the job was easy. Um, what came with the mainstream media in terms of, you know, being told to assimilate or get out, that was the hard part, right? That was the hard part in that you have to tell stories in the way that we want you to tell them. You have to be uh, not compassionate. You have to, um, you know, parachute in, parachute out. You have to not put your heart and soul into it. You have to not give people space or time. You have to ask for all their trauma first. And the, the complexities later, you know, when I went into journalism, I was told over and over again, we can't talk about complexities. We can't talk about racism. We can't talk about colonization. We can't talk about the systems. All we want to hear is the trauma. Um, we don't want to hear about the systems that we're responsible for upholding. Right, and um, the media has a lot to atone for that they have not. Mm -hmm. There are many apologies that have yet to come, right, from many institutions across Canada. Um, an apology is great, it's a first step, it's a baby step. Um, but the media has a lot to atone for. You know, in the 1960s, the CBC created a documentary about the wonderful ways that residential school, um, the wonderful experience that residential school provided for Indigenous children, right? That's, if you want to Google that, that is out there. Um, that There's been no apology for that yet. There's been no apology for the ways that we upholded the 60s scoop, the foster care system, um, colonial violence, how we continue to uphold those systems. And so, yeah, I mean, I mean, relating to Indigenous people as an Indigenous person is easy, it's amazing, it's great. Speaking to Indigenous people is great, it's empowering. Um, they, they loved me, right? They were always like, oh my God, you're so different. And I was like, well, like, what is everyone else doing? You know, I'm just talking to you, talking to you like I would anybody else. Um, but dealing with a very racist, violent institution of mainstream media as an arm of colonial violence, that was the hard part. Mm. Must have been uh, an incredible experience to separate yourself from having to either fit within that system or, or keep fighting against it or find yourself frustrated by it to being able to write your own book. Did you find yourself having to adjust your way of thinking? Or your way? You've always written, you kept journals as a teenager, as a child. Did you have to adjust your, your way of thinking in order to move into a book like this mm. that's truly really different? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, as a journalist, you are constantly told to keep yourself out of the story. You know, that's a big part of your training as a journalist. You never want to be the story. Um, you never want to put your opinion in the story. You know, impartiality is, is a strong piece of journalism that I think is very important. Um, writing a book, it's the complete opposite. You know, you're constantly sharing your opinion. When I wrote Unbroken, when I first started, and when I first gave my manuscript to my publisher, you know, they kept on encouraging me to have more of myself. And that was a daunting experience for a couple of reasons. I mean, for one, in my training as a journalist, it's just not what you do. You don't put yourself in the story. You don't share your opinions ever. And as an Indigenous journalist, I mean, you're over-scrutinized from day one, right? You walk in and you're immediately considered to be biased because you're Indigenous. You know, you might be, you know, me, Kixan, telling a story about Inuit people, you know, thousands of kilometers away from my community with a completely different, distinct culture and language and identity, but yet me telling stories about Inuit people is somehow biased, mm -hmm. right? Because we're all Indigenous even though, you know, white people writing about people in city council, even though they're all white, that's never considered bias. Um, saying this as a person who's, you know, white on my mom's side. Um, so, you know, it was, it was a difficult turn 
for me to um, put myself as much as I did in the book. And I think part of that, part of that grappling for me was also about not wanting to take away from those who did not survive, right? From those whose lives were cut too short and not wanting my story to overshadow those. Um, but one of the, the ways that I agreed, you know, in the end with my, my publisher, with my editor, with my agent about including myself in the book as much as I did is that, you know, when you're a journalist, you sort of have a flashlight and you're able to sort of shine a light into the problems or the systemic failures within sort of individual institutions like the child welfare system, residential school, and mainstream media. I mean, that's something we would rarely do on ourselves. We call that navel gazing. Um, <laughs> but, you know, with putting myself in the story, I was sort of able to shine a spotlight into the belly of the beast and show how all of these systems interact and how they continue today and how their systems or an entire system, you know, um, an empire building system that continues today, that continues to fail indigenous people and, and how they all interact, right? I think, you know, as, as Canadians, I think we do this thing where we're we sort of compartmentalize. We're really good at compartmentalizing things, right? Like, oh, residential school happened and now it's over and now we're healing from that. And oh, child welfare system, that's still going on, but that's sort of separate from, from the residential school system, right? And then land dispossession over here, like that's a thing of the past too, right? And we sort of, we don't see them as all operating together. I mean, residential school was part and parcel of the land dispossession process that continues today. The child welfare system is a continuation of residential school, right? They're all in the hope of assimilating indigenous people into white European culture, white supremacy, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think people forget that that has a stronghold on Canadian culture. Mm -hmm. We really want to believe that we're amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the best human rights track record, you know, the amazing environmental policies. Um, but the thing is, is that we're failing in many ways, right? And until we can look at ourselves and see the ways that we're failing, you know, not just Indigenous people, but each other, then we're not going to be able to fix the broken systems that exist today. And the public really, you know, I think, have such a huge role to, to play, whether it's all of us sitting here tonight or the public at large. I mean, the media as a tool of systemic uh, racism in some part of a certain pandering to what they think the public want to hear. Um, but I, I think there is a growing desire on the part of non-Indigenous people to learn and understand better. I think I so saw on Twitter or LinkedIn the other day, you mentioned the most common question you get asked is, how can we help? <laughs> <laughs> right? And, and I think that reflects a genuine desire mm -hmm. to learn and change and grow. And it's, you know, the, the non-Indigenous public have a huge role to play and continue role to play. In, in affecting change, but there's no question it's been challenging. And, and I just want to read a couple of other things, things that you wrote briefly about that in the book. Um, although things are changing, this is your experience when you're writing. Canadians are becoming more aware of how trauma from residential school has affected outcomes for Indigenous people. However, the non-Indigenous public often doesn't hear of the very serious ramifications of systemic racial segregation and economic and land disposition, as it's rarely discussed in the media or by politicians, which is what you were just you were just saying. And then you also say, as an Indigenous woman myself and as someone responsible for gauging public interest, I constantly grapple with why and how most cases of the murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls seem to just go unnoticed by the public. Do Indigenous women mean less to the wider public, to the media? And, and then finally, you make you make this point. There's so many tags in your book. I'm so <laughs> I could have read the whole thing. Poverty, racism, and hundreds of years of colonialism are challenging issues to articulate, never mind address. It's hard to get non-Indigenous Canadians to even believe that colonial violence exists, let alone act on it to create safety and equality for Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit people. Those are really important you know, statements to make. But at the same time, I mean, this book became a 
instant national bestseller. It is still topping the national bestsellers in Canada. And that tells me that people truly are hungry to learn more, understand what they can do and how things, how they can be influential on, on change. Is that, can you just comment on a little bit about the difference that we can make in influencing change? Mm -hmm. I think, I think like one of the things I've been thinking a lot about lately is just the dearth of data that exists around colonial figures. I get not, not colonial like heads, but colonial colonial data. So for example, um, for my Land Back podcast, I asked so many lawyers, I deep dived into so many peer reviewed articles and articles and politicians, you know, Mark Miller and I talked so much. Uh, Mark Miller is the, the, um, the oh, what is he, Indigenous Services Canada guy. <laughs> um, he's the guy who said, we've got to give land back. Right? Um, interesting. Um, so I asked so many people, like, how much of the land is owned by Indigenous people and how much is owned by non and like, like the governments, the crowns, and how much is privately owned. And so it was, like, impossible. It was an impossible figure. Like, in the end, we kind of just had to guess. Um, what we do know is 92% of the land in Canada is owned by the Canadian and provincial crowns. So it's owned by the government of Canada. Reserve land is not indigenous owned. That's crown land. And that's 0.2% of the population of the, the land mass in Canada. Um, seven, whatever, 12% of the land is privately owned. That doesn't mean it's indigenous owned. It means it's in private hands. A lot of the land that you know indigenous people have won back through these court cases, they still don't have. Um, jurisdiction over, right? So there's jurisdiction and then there's ownership. What's the difference between the two? Um, you know, even Sanok, people might have heard about that in the news. That is not Indigenous owned. That is a lease. You know, it's a hundred year lease. It's a lot longer than a lot of the other leases. Um, but like the, the data to get to that, um, some of the other questions around, um, um, you know, who, who kills Indigenous women? Um, I can't remember what the research I was doing yesterday was, but I was like, there's like so little data on colonial violence inflicted upon Indigenous people. Like, it's impossible to find so many figures. Um, that's what we, like, that, that can, that's something that like non-Indigenous people can work on today, right? Is like, what have you done, <laughs> right? What is the effect on what you have done, right? So. You know, I'm white and I'm Indigenous. On my white side, I should be fixing the broken systems that my ancestors created. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, my ancestors didn't create these systems. Well, our ancestors tacitly consented to these systems. You know, we went around our daily business thinking this was all great or pretending they didn't exist. That's still a problem, right? We have to atone for that. We have to fix these broken systems. And that, that's up to us, right? We shouldn't be asking Indigenous people, how should we fix these systems that we created? We, they don't know, like, you created them. We, they, Indigenous people didn't create them, so why are you asking us how to fix them? We don't know, you broke them. So, but it's always Indigenous people, right? So Indigenous people are always saying, how can we stop the overrepresentation of Indigenous people who are in prison, right? Um, how can we stop the overrepresentation of Indigenous children in the child welfare system? When the problem is an indigenous people, the problem is the system themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, indigenous children that are in child welfare systems, I did a deep dive on that as well. Most of the children are in there for reasons of neglect. When you look into that, it's reasons of poverty. Maybe they didn't have a warm winter coat. Maybe they didn't have a box spring on their bed. Children are getting taken away for those reasons. There are non-indigenous people who are living in far worse conditions who are keeping their children. Like the discrepancy is mind blowing and continues today. So on my white side, I need to be looking at that. I need to be looking at the dearth of statistics around that, of the harm that these systems are causing indigenous people. I need to be looking at the ways that we can fix these systems, dismantle these systems, rebuild these systems. On my indigenous side, I need to be focusing on my language. I need to be focusing on my son learning his language. I need to be focusing on rebuilding my cultural laws, we don't have protocols, we have laws. We have laws that have kept the climate, the environment, and our people safe for generations. Mm -hmm. That is what we need to be focusing on, right? We, we don't need to be focused on fixing colonial systems that we didn't bring in. 
right? We need to be building up our big houses, building up our feast halls, relearning our languages, learning our languages, rebuilding our communities that have been destroyed by colonial violence, right? We shouldn't be telling non-Indigenous people what to do, <laughs> right? It's not our problem. So for me, it's a little bit, um, I have a lot of work to do, <laughs> right? But it's important for me to educate in terms of role modeling my power and privilege and how that and what that looks like. But it, asking Indigenous people, what can we do, right? I don't mind, I don't mind, you gotta speak up, right? You, that's what you need to do, you need to speak up, you need to use your voice, we're tired, we're exhausted. Um, we're tired of being the only ones in the room saying, hey, that's wrong. Um, um, but, but also like Indigenous people shouldn't be asked that question time and time again, because it's not our problem. I was going to ask it just touch briefly on in that middle space between what we can be doing, what you need to focus on. You did write about the hearings, the, there's been various hearings on two, the murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. And, and over the space of time, the, the last set of hearings, you reflected on the importance of those hearings for non-Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you commented on, on acquaintances of yours who, like the Cameron, who mm -hmm. never heard those stories before. And it, it, it was just such a fundamental and empowering thing. Of course, a very important set of hearings for Indigenous people themselves. You talk about how, for the first time, people were able to tell their stories and have those acknowledged as their own truths. Mm -hmm. And to, I think you, the expression you use it, is it's so very healing to be seen. Mm -hmm. Is there still work that is needed in that space of bringing out these stories, of having both Indigenous people have that opportunity to be telling their own truths and having those truths acknowledged and seen and heard, and for non-Indigenous people to be hearing them? Do we need more of that still? I mean, I think it's really simple. I think Indigenous people need to be believed. Mm -hmm. Woo! <laughs> there's so many opportunities to, to listen and to learn. And there's, there's so many instances where we're continuing to not be believed, right? De denialism, residential school denialism is on the rise. Um, you know, I went on Twitter the other day, or X or whatever it is, and I was like, oh, these are all boss, you know? And then I was like, actually, they're not. These are real people. These are people I know. These are, you know, lauded authors, you know, um, who I grew up thinking were great people. And now they're saying that residential schools should be acknowledged as having done good. What? Um, it's, it's atrocious. And so, you know, there's been, you know, 150,000 Indigenous people, residential school survivors who have shared their stories. Um, that was 2015. You know, I was a little bit shocked in 2021 when everyone was like, oh my God, children died. And it's like, we already went through this in 2015. It's like the TRC told you that 6,000 children died mm -hmm. as a result of their experience in residential school, whether it was, you know, suicide, whether it was starvation, whether it was fires, whether it was neglect. Um, we already knew this. So it was a bit of, it was, I was miffed a bit. Like, mm -hmm. why are you all so shocked when well, we already learned this? Mm -hmm. So it tells me, you know, um, there's there's so many reports, hearings that um, readily available information on the internet. You know, there's 5,000 recommendations, calls to action on the internet available right now as a result of all of these inquiries that have happened, you know, into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, into residential school, into Helen Betty Osborne, into the justice system. Um, but still, you know, it's... It, it's still asked of us, what can we do when, when these things have happened? And so I just tell people, like, you need to believe us when we tell our stories. Like, we're not making it up. You know, hundreds of thousands of people aren't making this up. Like, this was a real experience of the past and of today. Mm -hmm. And so that's my message, is just believe us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
we touched a moment ago too on um, the importance of Indigenous people believing in themselves and the work that, that um, you have to do. I just want to read a couple of, of short clips that you uh, wrote about in terms of how things might be starting to change or how you've observed things changing in the first instance. So, as you said, when you started your book in 2015, racism was a no-no to talk about in the journalism industry. In 2017, you were questioned about using the term colonisation. In 2019, journalists were not to give the reality of genocide in Canada any weight. And then in 2021, all these rules began to break. And what you then say is there's hope in knowing change is possible. Today I see young Indigenous women, girls and two-spirit people reclaiming their language, their culture, their lands and their power. I'm also witnessing us taking back joy as the burden of addressing systemic racism and violence is shared more widely. In that vein, I see young Indigenous women and two-spirit people lifting up and empowering each other to live our lives without the oppression of colonisation. Loving ourselves and each other as Indigenous people is a radical act of decolonization in a world that teaches us to constantly self-hate. I thought that was a very powerful and beautiful yeah. thing to say. So I'm glad I had that one to, to bring in <laughs> just yeah. then. Yeah. And um, you know, one of the things you said, perhaps just as a, a last question, because I'm sure everybody here has got lots of questions for you as well. Last year, I listened uh, to our lovely very own Gabriella still claims her as our own Sheila Rogers interviewed you on the next chapter. And one of the things you spoke about was your desire and your hope for a better world. And I'd like to ask you to, to tell us what that better world looks like for you and, and for your son and, and for all of us. Hmm. I mean, right now we're just seeing um, some really dark times. You know, my heart is with Gaza. My heart is with Palestine. Mm -hmm. um, we need to have collective liberation. We need to have our collective voices heard. Um, we need to not be punished for speaking up about the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, people are watching the most horrific atrocities of our current lifetime and people are being silenced. Mm -hmm. And there's a better way forward. You know, we need to listen, we need to believe, we need to um, use our voices, use our power. You know, I have a little tiny bit of power. I spoke to thousands of people, 3,000 people at this international educational conference and I had no notes and at the end I had, I gave a keynote and at the end I just had Gaza to hold our public officials to account to um, call for a ceasefire immediately. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I left and I went off stage and I had like 20 people, many of them um, Palestinian people come up to me crying saying this is the first time I've heard this at the time the war was raging on, the genocide was raging on for I think 34 days and they were like, you're the first person I've heard speak out. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I have this much power. You know, and I'm only allowed, able, not allowed, but I'm only able to speak out now because I don't have an institutional tie. Mm -hmm. What does that tell you about Canada? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Where the institutions that we live within do not permit us to talk about the truth. Mm -hmm. Right? So how far have we come when we talk about reconciliation mm -hmm. when we're still firing people from their jobs mm -hmm. for standing up for children being murdered? Mm -hmm. And there's a better path forward, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a way for us to have freedom and love and joy and for the rest of the world to experience that, right? And mm -hmm. I'm not sure why we're living in these times where it feels like we're back in, you know, when my ancestors were going through the most hell of their lives, we're witnessing this in front of our eyes. Mm -hmm. There's no escaping it. There's no excuse now, mm -hmm. right? I remember growing up and, you know, pointed to uh, a white family member. I said, that's a residential school over there on Quadra. And he said, no, it's not. that's not true. You're making that up, mm. right? That was possible then. 
right? You, there's no excuse now. Mm -hmm. There's no excuse. You're seeing what's going on. So we're not there in our country yet. Mm -hmm. We're not ready for reconciliation because we haven't accepted the truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was going to make that last question my last question, but it occurs <laughs> to me to ask you one more before, so forgive me. But you know, you do have power in your incredibly strong voice that you're sharing with us tonight. You have delinked yourself from that institutional um, box that you were in. What are you going to be turning your power to next in terms of writing? <laughs> um, I'm super, super excited about the next journey forward. Um, my next, you know, my first book was on women and empowering women and girls and two-spirit people, non-binary people. My book didn't include um, non-binary and trans experiences because it was primarily about myself as an Indigenous girl and woman. Um, my next book is going to be about men and empowering men to um, go on their healing journey, right? And I think a lot of men are told that healing is not masculine or it's not strong, but I think that's, um, that's kept them away from um, starting on this journey. And I think it's time. I think um, there's a lot to be said about, about healthy men, and I think we don't hear about that enough. And it's a whole journey. <laughs> um, it's, I'm really excited about it. Um, have some exciting news coming out in the next couple of weeks, but um, I'm hoping the book will be done in like a year. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's a note to the Arts Council. Future <laughs> <laughs> event that we can come back here to hear from you about that particular book. But I want to thank you for the conversation with me tonight, Angela. And uh, we would um, certainly invite questions from the audience. I think we're going to. It's actually quite hard for me to see the audience at the moment, but we do have a mic set up. But before we start taking questions, uh, we do have just a very respectful request to all of you in terms of how you pose your questions tonight. Um, and uh, we'd ask that you really listen carefully to this request, but I'm actually going to borrow that lovely term that Angela used earlier, and that is we're essentially going to ask you not to do any navel gazing. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, you know, I, I'm sure that if anything like me, that after this event, um, you're going to want to share and reflect on all the things that Angela said, all the things you've heard tonight, and, and the questions, uh, you know, the answers that we're going to be hearing to the, the questions as well, and, and think about them. And, and we are definitely, I spoke to Anne earlier, we're calling on the Arts Council to provide a space at some uh, later date that you can do that, that you can talk amongst yourselves, or uh, we can talk amongst ourselves about what we've heard tonight. But please understand that tonight is not the time to do that. What we would like you to do is very much take the opportunity that you have to learn and hear from somebody who is such an authority on uh, the topics in her book Unbroken and the other uh, issues that we've already talked about tonight. And, and so would ask that you ask questions rather than just bring comments to the mic, uh, listen rather than just bring opinion to the mic, and above all, just use this opportunity to, to learn. So with that note in mind, very respectfully, humbly, but uh, we'd be very, very happy uh, for you to bring your questions to the mic in the centre. Thank you very much for being here today and sharing your knowledge. I'm very respectful. I'm, I'm a good fangirl all over right now, but I'll try not to. Um, so I am Indigenous, I'm uh, Gangeha on my mom's side. Um, I'm here in a really weird situation. I just spent two days in um, uh, matriarchal teachings uh, in Vancouver. But that, the question I have has nothing to do with this. This was a question that was posed to me a year ago. A friend of mine was a juror in the fiction trials, a white woman. And she came to me with the question, and I was absolutely gobsmacked. I had no response for her, and it is, she felt that the spirits of the women were still with her, and she needed to know what to do, that she is a juror. Like the, and then I realized that there was, no, there was nothing offered to those folks, and she wanted to. And so what could I tell her 
to do with her experience because that, like, she's a changed person. So that was, I don't know if that's a relevant question or an opinion, but anyway. Yeah, that's like a super spiritual question, right? And it's a very valid question. I know I went to the Picton farm like years later, like 2016, I went there with um, a former cop, like Laura Schenner, um, former VPD. Um, and you could feel it. And I took the plane back to Winnipeg where I was living at the time and I could just feel the heaviness and the darkness and the pain. And yeah, I, I don't feel like any of that's been settled, you know? I have this feeling like it's just unsettled and there's so many stories that haven't been told. And I mean, on a kind of weird level on that, like my book has popped off of like three women's shelves, like just flew out. Mm -hmm. And I do believe like it has something to do with that. Like those spirits are unsettled. And I think like, I don't know, it's hard to say in front of an audience because people have different ideas about spirituality, but I think just like a gentle prayer and an offering, you know, I always offer. And you can offer anything, you know, people think it has to be smudged or tobacco or whatever, but sometimes candies, you know, mm -hmm. if I pass away, I'm sure I'm going to like the candies. <laughs> um, but just an offering and just an intention that I feel you and... And also, like, maybe that's unwanted in her space as much as she wants to carry that pain. I've had a lot of journalist friends, like, even white journalists, who have to, like, tell spirits, like, I need you to go away right now. Like, I just, I need to, I need space. Mm. Because those stories, they cling to you. And even the spirits of the alive people cling to you, right? Because that truth needs to come out. And it gnaws at you. Because sometimes it's not coming out in the way that people need it to and you have to just tell it, like, I, I need, I, I can't deal with this right now, but I wish you well, and I wish you peace. Thank you. But, but it's valid. Like, let her know that that's valid, and a lot of people are experiencing that. Huh. Thank you. Yeah. Please do come up to the mic if you've got a question. Heaven, Thank you so much for coming to our little community. Um, um, the question is, is actually kind of piggybacking a little bit on the last question, and it is, I think, a spiritual question. Um, I went to school with one of Picton's victims, a uh, very beautiful and shiny spirit. Uh, I don't know if it's appropriate to name her, and I, I don't want to disrespect her in any way, but... Um, I, I, I guess I'm, because I'm not super familiar with your spirituality or the spirituality of different nations, but something that really came to me uh, was when, after a lot of this information came out about missing and murdered Indigenous women, there were marches that happened in the downtown east side to honor them and also to bring awareness to this issue. And there were always eagles flying above these. And I don't know if you want to speak to that or if there's anything... To me, there was some spiritual comfort in that, uh, but I don't know why. That was just a feeling that I got, that we were being honored, or those spirits were maybe visiting. Um, but I do believe that speaking, I've noticed speaking about these situations and honoring these people, as you say, for their strength. This woman that passed away was extremely charismatic and beautiful, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to highlight that aspect as well. And I'm just wondering if there's anything you would like to speak to in regards to that. I don't know. I think like there's a, there's a mystery yeah. in life and there's a, there's meaning that we take from it and it's deeply personal. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Heather. Um, Arctic Wanderers is all who are part of the Indigenous Authors Book Club to identify the we are. <clears throat> Angela, I'm a former journalist, and I want to say how much I admire how you put up with <laughs> all the shit you had to put up with. <laughs> One of the moments in the book that has stayed with me is when you were in that ceremony for the regalia of your community. The button blanket was put upon you, 
and you realized that you were being affirmed mm. as a truth teller by your ancestors. Mm. And it struck me that that was almost like a, a contrasting model of storytelling, journalism, mm. to the CBC. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah. and I don't know whether you'd like to comment on that, but just the, so the question would be, would you say the CBC has a lot of decolonization to do? <laughs> <laughs> just a tad. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if people want to hear about that, the button blanket story. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, I did this story about a grandfather, Max Johnson, um, and his granddaughter. And so I remember all the non-native journalists were like, he's an elder. And I'm like, dude, he's like 50 years old. He's not an elder. He's a grandfather. Like, I can be a grandma right now. Um, so anyways, he was a grandfather. His granddaughter, Tori Ann, was 12 years old. She's an amazing, incredible man. He's raising so many of his family members, like such a good guy. And he was opening up her bank account. Um, he already had an account at Vimo. He was opening up her account so that he could transfer her money, wire transfer, so that she could go on basketball games. And she's like super cultural, so transfer her money for that. And so um, I broke the story that they were arrested while trying to open up a bank account. Um, and uh, I went international overnight. I was the journalist who broke the story. And um, I was the first journalist who went to their community. When BMO came there, they like chartered a plane and brought like 19 BMO executives to the community um, for a ceremony. And it was sort of like a shaming feast in, in my way, in my big sound way. It wasn't, um, but in my mind, it seemed like that. And they said, no, 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 this is a washing ceremony. This is to cleanse us from the harm that BMO has done. And the BMO executives that were walked around the fire, they were all blanketed. And it was sort of like, I said, well, what was that for? And they said it was to, to show their face. Like, we show our face that we've done this. We're holding ourselves up and that this is what we've done. And then the, the purpose of the ceremony was to wash Tori Ann and Maxwell and um, his nephew who was there, who experienced it as well, to wash them off of the trauma and to redress them and so that they wouldn't have nightmares about this experience again. And it was also like a witnessing of the community, you know, BMO created this mistake and so in hopes that it would never happen again and for there to be witnessing around that. And so before I went, I was reporting on it. It was like a massive story. I was on NPR, I was on BBC, I was on all the shows for like months. So I'm going to the community and before I go, Maxwell sends me a message and says, what's your plan? And I was like, oh no because I knew that meant I was getting a gift. And at CDC, you can't take gifts from people you're doing stories on, which I understand to a degree. You know, you wouldn't take gifts from cops giving you donuts in hopes that you're going to do a good story on them, right? You need to remain impartial. But there are some things that don't have two sides. Like, there's no other side of racism. There's no other side of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. There's no other side of Tori Ann and Maxwell being arrested while opening up a bank account, especially when the VPD and the bank and Indigenous Services Canada all said they did wrong. There's no other side of that. There's no way that I could be like pandering to this community so that I'm doing a good story or them pandering to me to do a good story. Like they'll just, anyway, so I go into the office and I said, I'm getting a gift. And they were like, oh my God, like, cause already, already you're Indigenous, like already you're biased. You know, that was the vibe. Like, what are we going to do? And they were like, how much? And so you're allowed to accept gifts if it's under $200. So say Rogers Arena is like, you can watch this hockey game, it's $200. You're allowed to do that and then do a story on it. So they're like, how much does it cost? I'm like, I don't know, $80. So they're like, okay. And they're like, already like losing their minds a bit. So I go to the community and I, I was right. They called me down and they said, um, here's this beautiful painting that Maxwell made for you with your plan on it. And I gave them gifts as well. And I knew my camera guy was there and filming everything. So I gave them a gift as well. And I'm like, you know, this is, you know, in the spirit of reciprocity, this is a spiritual contract that I will tell the truth and you will tell the truth. That is why we give gifts. It's not like a monetary transactional agreement. So then I go back to my seat and I'm with my son as well, which CBC also lost their minds about. Um, 
So we're there in the bleachers and they, they, and they said, we want Angela Stare and her son to come down again. And I was like, what? So I go down and um, the, all the hereditary chiefs and the elders and the matriarchs are there. And they said, we want to honor you for the work that you've done on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, like nothing to do with the story. And they blanketed me in a royal blue button blanket and an apron. Like they fully dressed me in this incredible regalia. And I was just like, you see my face in the pictures. I'm like, at one, on one side, I'm like so honored and like, oh my God, like this is incredible. And on the other side, I'm like, holy fuck, CBC is going <laughs> to lose their fucking lines. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh no. And so this is a horrible story. So, but it's also an opportunity to teach people about what could have been done differently and how somebody mm. could have spoken out. So I go back to my, my hub in Vancouver. I fly back to Vancouver and I'm like, so I was gifted a button blanket. And they're like, how much did it cost? I'm like, I don't know, like 200? <laughs> Artif is laughing because they're like $10,000. <laughs> so they're like, oh, they're still like, oh my God, this is insane. The optics of, because it's, it's not really about actual impartiality or bias, it's optics. Optics are more important than the actual thing. So they're like, okay, well, here's what we'll do. We'll get this white guy to front the entire story on TV for you. So I'm the only reporter there in the world. Um, it's all my interviews with BMO, with indigenous people, with like everybody. It's all my vids. I'm the one who's directing the photographer, the videographer. It's all my point of view. It's everything. And I'm, he's basically sitting on the edge of my desk and I'm writing the story for him. And it's his byline, his name, his face, white man's face on the story. And so someone at one of my last talks said, what would have happened if he would have gone to your boss and said, I don't think this is right. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, I never thought of that. But yeah, that, that would have changed everything because the boss, what do you think he was? A white guy, right? And so those two guys have credibility in the system. I have none, right? So me being like, I don't think this is right. I think this is wrong. They're like, we don't really care. But if the white reporter who was assigned to do this went and talked to the white boss, white male boss, and said, this is messed up. Like, I don't agree with this at all. And here's the reasons why. Mm -hmm. That would have been taken into consideration, mm -hmm. right? And so that is why I think speaking up within your institutions or with your groups, with your bros, with your friends, whatever, is so incredibly important. And that could have changed everything. You know, that could have, like, I was silenced in that. As an Indigenous woman, I was silenced in telling a story that I broke. And it was just so, um, just looking back when I tell the story, people are always just, like, shocked. But it was completely normalized at CDC. It was like, oh, yeah, this is how we do things. Like, fine. You know, it was like, okay, it's it sucks, but I guess this is the way that it is. But it's not right. And so you know things aren't right, but why aren't you saying anything? Like, what what's the reason? Right? It's because you just believe that the system knows what's right more than what you know what's right. Mm -hmm. and that can be one of the hardest things to overcome from within. I mean, not for me. I mean, at CBC, I was, I was like the only one always yeah. speaking up, right? Mm -hmm. And then when I left, people were like, I'm sorry, I didn't say anything, right? And it's, it, it's frustrating. Yeah. I remember Jody Wilson Rabel that was like, what, because I interviewed her. I was like, what's it like for you? <laughs> and then she was like, well, I walk in the room and everyone either hates me, fears me, or is scared of me, or, you know, and I'm like, it's the same. It's exactly the same as me. And you're always the only one. Mm -hmm. You're always the only one speaking truth to power or speaking up for justice or speaking up for the little guy, which is yourself, <laughs> right? And um, I just don't know, I don't know why it's so difficult it's like it's uncomfortable, but it's like what what's uncomfortable to you versus what's uncomfortable for me, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a, like a tiny inconvenience mm -hmm. of your day. For me, it's like costing me a lot more, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We do have time for at least two more questions, I think. I don't know if it came off. Hi, <laughs> thank you for coming tonight. My name's Diane. Um, <laughs> this is. Listening to this description of how the institution of the CDC is failing us, I'm left with this awkward question about if our national broadcaster 
is doing this. Is there any place we can go to get credible, good information that's told with honesty? Mm. I mean, I, I do think there there is a lot of incredible journalists at the CBC as well who are doing incredible work and things have changed so much, right? Um, there's a reason why a lot of the Indigenous women in particular have left and there's not so many Indigenous female journalists there anymore. But, um, you know, when you go to the CBC website, there's tons of amazing stories, including about what's actually happening. I mean, I haven't looked for a couple of weeks, but the last time I looked, I was like, oh, some journalists are doing some really incredible work on like journalism, on what's happening in Gaza right now. Like that is truthful and accurate. <laughs> Same as indigenous stories. Like I remember in 2010, you'd go on our page and it'd be like one a week, one indigenous story. Now there's tons, you open it up and there's tons. There's, a, there's incredible work and I, as much as I had such a horrible experience, I do, and maybe it's just I'm brainwashed, but I do, I do believe in journalism. I really do. You know, I, I fear right now for what's happening to the journalism industry, that it's being completely demolished and people are, you know, going on TikTok and believing conspiracy theories. And it, it scares me, you know, there's a couple of things where I'm like, ooh, like that was obviously fact-checked by a journalist and then you go on TikTok and it's like a completely different story that's not true. I, I really believe in journalism, I really do. Like I really believe in fact-checking, I believe in research that comes from credible people. Do I believe in the way that we rely heavily on, for example, the police rather than victims and family members? No, but I believe that there's journalists right now who are doing the best. The, the most incredible work, especially younger journalists who are coming up. Unfortunately, a lot are losing their jobs or their casual employees, but I do believe that there's incredible work being done. And, and those people are fighting the same systems that I had to in many regards. Hi, my name is Alan, and I'm also a member of the Indigenous Writers Book Club. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say, okay, so I think the police's failure to not investigate, find the perpetrators, get them charged, get them convicted, is a major part of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls continue to be murdered and not found. And, and, and <laughs> no. Nobody's ever held accountable. And sometimes they know who did it. Mm -hmm. And they just let that be okay. And I think I think if, if non-Indigenous people in Canada were writing about the outrage we feel about the police, the RCMP, not investigating, letting this go, pretending it's not happening. <laughs> One of the things that was uh, recently, last year, last summer in Duncan, a young lady, a Native woman was, was murdered found covered in garbage with a skin on her, and they said, we don't think it's suspicious. Yeah. So if, if we all started writing mm -hmm. with our outrage that this is not okay, mm -hmm. this is not acceptable, I think maybe the police and the RCMP might just start taking it more seriously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Any final question? Oh. Uh -oh. I see two hands come up. Two more questions. Michelle. Thank you. My name is thank you so much for being here. My name is Michelle. Uh, I first want to thank you for some two words you said at the very beginning of your talk. You said colonization failed. And I'm just really grateful for that idea. And I think there's uh, a lot in that to kind of hold on to and move forward with. Um, but I, I work at the BC Arts Council and I have the privilege of working with a number of indigenous uh, artists uh, who work in a number of different um, uh, writers and filmmakers and visual artists. And just wonder if you have any thoughts on the role of artists and the arts in this uh, journey we're on together. Yeah, I mean, who, who said it? Did Bob Dylan say it? Like, artists are the ones that are going to change the world? <laughs> was it Bob Dylan? I don't know who it was, but... Um, <laughs> I mean, people were like, are you going to go to politics now? And I'm like, are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> no, no chance. 
Sure. Um, I, th- I mean, I think, okay, I'm going, I'm going off kilter. I was going to go on a whole tangent there, but I think, I think uh, artists are making incredible changes and differences and opening people's minds and um, creating dialogue and discussion and discourse and change. Um, so I think, I mean, it's, as an artist, like, um, I think before, no, I think like, I've always been an artist. There was a time when I spent more time in it. I think when I just had my son, I was doing a lot of art shows and I relied a lot on arts councils for whether it was funding or art shows. And um, yeah, and I don't know where that's at, but I feel like they've lost a lot of funding and I think that they're incredibly important. Um, yeah, I know Canada Council is completely shifting their um, their funding structure right now. I've depended heavily on Canada Council of the Arts for my book, like mm-hmm. probably primarily. I, my book wouldn't have gotten done if it wasn't for them, for sure. So I think they're incredibly important for, I mean, look at this book. Like I had no idea it would be a bestseller. It would like be nominated for Governor Generals, for Hillary Weston, all of this stuff. And it, it was large part. There's no way a journalism, um, salary can can keep you going right um so i think these councils are incredibly important just for the funding element alone i mean that's what i that's my experience with the councils yeah sure we get the last question um i also have just recently written your book um in the framework of this book club one of the things i really found interesting in the book towards the end is where you're talking about the indigenous led initiatives in Winnipeg, like the Bear Clan and like Drag the Red, which I don't know if that exists or anything comparable with that exists anywhere else in Canada. And maybe, maybe you do know that there is and you would say something about it. I'm assuming that you were wrapping up the writing of the book at the time that the latest round of revelations came out in Winnipeg around murdered women and the fight around opening the landfills and searching for their bodies. Is there, have you been following that and is there anything you would like to share that would have been in the book if you kept on working on it for another year? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Well, I'm glad Bob Kenny was elected. (laughs) Um, You know, I don't know what's happened with that. I mean, that's what I was going to say about the Arts Council. It's going to be like, well, Bob Kenny is doing some really cool things um, for a politician. but no, I haven't heard. I mean, I've been following him a little bit to see what he's been doing. I mean, the last I heard is that was one of his electoral promises was to search the landfill. Um, but how heartbreaking is that, right? That the police's like um, risk of injury is more important than women, credible institutions, governments, media that have changed and the RCMP and the DPD are not one. <laughs> Right. Um, and, um, so, and I don't know if Wapkinu has the, I don't know, the power even to, I mean, we look at like the, 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 the BC government's role in changing the salary or the, the mandate of RCMP. And it's, it's pretty interesting when you get into the weeds about their mandate and what they have control over to do on their own without any other body. So, um, yeah, I haven't heard an update about that. I hope to hear one soon. I know there's still, like, protests, like there was one two days ago. So it's concerning. Mm-hmm. Angela, I think we could keep you here all night. <laughs> I'm sure there's people with more questions, but uh, we do have to honour the time. and words well, just about family and uh, speaking on behalf of everybody here tonight to thank you for bringing your powerful voice and your authenticity and your honesty to share with us. This is an incredibly important book. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for being great audience. Thank you very much, everybody. It's been such a pleasure to have this warm welcome for these wonderful women. Um, 
I wanted to acknowledge that not only is Angela who she is, but she's also an artist. And recently, you may have seen her art on the cover of um, the most recent BC Studies oh, yeah. as well. Thank you. <laughs> A couple of things really resonated for me here this evening, listening to these words. It was before your time, but I had the privilege of spending a great deal of time with the, the late Joe Mathias from mm. the Spanish Nation. One of the things he said to me, talking about residential school, child welfare system, and all of it was, he said, Artist Cooper, the miracle is our survival. <laughs> and in a sense, it really is. I think when you consider all that has happened, yeah. Um, the resiliency, the fact that we survived, the fact we have Angela mm -hmm. here to tell us these stories and to continue to thrive and tell us more, going on to toxic masculinity is an inspiration. I want to also thank the, um, the Gabriella Arts Council. Getting you here was not easy, <laughs> but my colleagues on the Gabriella Arts Council eventually saw the light <laughs> and joined in <laughs> and here you are and I do hope you'll come back again. Um, aren't we fortunate to have these two working to, evol to evolve our communities into a just, caring and equal society? In no way do I want to detract from the passion and the brilliance we witness here this evening, but I do want to remind ourselves that it is in each of us to be a vehicle to create change. In each of us. I just love that. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Breaking Bannock program, I wanted to offer this small token to both of you. Thank you. And I'm signing books. Yes, oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> Angela's very kindly agreed to sign books to anybody who has a copy, and there's copies for sale, obviously, at the back. We'll just provide a good space where you can sit and sign in comfort. So take advantage. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.